thank you for coming, Tony, to share with us. And because uh, I know there's going to be some really cool things. And let's hear, have a round of applause for my new friend, Tony. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I want to go back and reiterate that. I've already benefited. Uh, it's been aston astonishing to me, my experience already, starting with Stan this morning when I said, where's the sand pile? And he didn't laugh at me and said, just stand it on it. Um, some of the things I've touched, and then conversations with Glenn, with Nikki, and some others, just about things that are happening. So I've already benefited, and for the listening audience and anybody watching this video, uh, you're missing it if you aren't here. And uh, I'll talk more about that. But today, uh, that's not my phone, is it? It actually is. Today I want to talk, and somebody from Sarasota is calling me. Today I want to talk about new narratives. And I want to start with and make it personal. So I want to talk to you about you, your organizations, your community. And my question for you is, what is your leadership narrative? Or your personal narrative? Um, if I asked you today, and I'll ask you again at the end, what's your narrative? So if some examples of narratives are, some people may remember, and it'll, it'll be your generational uh, thing. Is your narrative, are you Roy Rogers or the Lone Ranger um, you know, fighting for justice? Or are you Django? And if you don't know who Django is, the D is silent, which is a line from the movie. Or it's the Hateful Eight. So who are you? Are you the Lone Ranger or are you Django? Are you Superman fighting for truth, justice, and the American way? Or are you the Dark Knight? Someone would call him, would describe him as being slightly off balance. Are you Cinderella or the, knight or the Barbie from the 1950s? Or are you Katniss? Who are you? What's your personal narrative? So my name is Tony Collins. I'm president of the Blake Collins Group. We're a public relations firm. Our specialty is crisis management. Hopefully you'll never need any, uh, any of those services, but let me know if you do. Um, we do strategic communication, and it's mostly about change. It's about changing narratives, changing communities, and changing minds. And we work with a number of companies on business development, having them think about how to take their uh, current position and think about where business is going. But today I want to talk to you about narratives and to tell you three things. There's a lot of information about narratives uh, in academia. People have been writing about narratives since the 1920s, almost 100 years. But um, narratives are important because they are driving culture. If you think about it, narratives um, drive culture. They're, they're, they drive values. They drive companies. What narratives do is decide how you view the world. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of narratives that you've probably heard. Maybe you can finish it for me. But there's the story about truth. George Washington chopped down the, and he could not. It's a narrative. It's a, it's, it's a story. I don't know if George Washington actually chopped down a cherry tree. But he tells that story. Somebody just said it didn't happen. But it's a narrative, and it talks about, at that point, political leadership. You, know, you can't, you know, his, his narrative said, you cannot lead this country, you can't be a great leader in America unless you tell the truth. Um, some would question whether or not that narrative's still in play. But I'm not going to talk about politics. Um, Robin Hood um, used to another story, mytholo mythology, a narrative. And Robin Hood would go and live in the Sherwood Forest, and he would rob from the, and give to the, OK. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, depends on which movie you watch, but we all know the story of Robin Hood. That's a narrative. So then there's the story of the Lone Ranger who stands up and fights for truth and justice in the Old West. And he talks about how he had to put on this mask to avenge and uh, avenge uh, uh, the, the outrage of his, of his brother's loss of life and stand up and defend people in the Old West. And he had his trusty companion, which Sarah mentioned earlier, Tonto. 
And they worked in collaboration, and they defended the world. That, that, I think that series was on for 20-some years, and everybody watched. Any, anybody, any millennials in here not know who the Lone Ranger is, just out of curiosity? Everybody knows who, even if you never saw it. So there's the Lone Ranger, and all of those things are narrative, and they're used to convey values. They're used to convey a point of view, and within them, you can tell stories. Stories are just a, a series of actions. They're things that happen in sequence, but a narrative gives it, gives it context and a point of view. Um, if you look at the world that we live in today, we use narratives to, to drive everything, and uh, we call it a shortcut to what people actually believe. I'm gonna steal a quote from Jim Artem who's in the audience. And he and I have been talking about narratives, and I don't know if you can read all that, that, but a narrative is simply a short, is a nudge that creates a bias. Bias is not a negative word. Bias is a preconceived notion about how, how things operate. So if you're talking, there was, I, I'm not going to remember the name of the play, but it used to be the United States would do well when U.S. Steel did well. That was a line. If, you, if the steel company was doing well, then, then the economy was booming. Does anybody believe that anymore? Does anybody believe that the future of the US economy is driven by what happens to the steel industry? They used to say that about um, automobiles, General Motors, Detroit. If, if the automobile industry was doing well, the whole economy would do well. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying that that's not how our economy works anymore. But they're all, those things are all about narratives. So narratives, there's a lot of information about it, but I'm only going to talk about three parts of a narrative that you should focus on. One, it's, um, it, it, is the, it's, it's, it seems self-explanatory, but if you have a narrative, you have a narrator. You have someone who is telling the story. And that becomes important, because I'll you go back to George Washington. George Washington is telling the story, and our history books talk about him as our first president, a general, an honest person who led this country to freedom. Well, he's credible. The narrator, the impact of the, the story, the narrative, has to do with who the narrator is and how credible they are. Because if, if, the, if the narrator gets, has, has a problem with credibility, has a problem with, uh, values of culture, your, your, narr your, your narrative goes away. So narrator is an important thing to look at. Um, things are changing in the world of um, narratives, and they're changing dramatically because we are, as a, a country and as a society, beginning to question the narrators. We now ask questions about everybody. We go back and look at history, and we dig things up and we reevaluate how we perceive them. So uh, Thomas Jefferson, one of our great leaders, great political thinker, part of his narrative has changed when people began to go back and realize that Thomas Jefferson had at least two families. So now there's a whole other discussion about what Thomas Jefferson says, what he does, how we perceive him. So the narrator is important. Narrators are central to any of your, any, anything you do in terms of talking about the new narratives. It's changing because we go back and we look at everything. It's changing because of technology. And it's changing because of political trends. The other thing, the second thing that happens in all narratives is you are telling a story. It could be fictional, non-fictional. You're telling a story, and you're telling it from a point of view. You've got George Washington topping down the cherry tree. He's telling a story to talk to us about how this country is going to go forward and what we think about it. And he's telling you from the, from the point of view of a general, from the point of view of a, of a political leader, of a, a point of view that says these are the foundations of our country. So when you begin to look at stories or, or, or any narrative, you will find that within that story, there is a point of view. I was actually looking at one Listening to a story this morning on NPR, which was talking about, um, there's a story about fracking. They were talking about fracking. And I heard, I heard the same story this morning on Morning Joe. Some of you may know Joe Scarborough. So 
the, this, the, the point of view on NPR was how fracking was being questioned internationally about whether or not it has a negative impact on the ecology, on the landscape, you know, what are, what, how do we assess the long-term impacts of fracking? That was a story about fracking from the point of view of an environmentalist. Uh, I saw Joe Scarborough talk about it this morning, and he was talking about fracking in terms of a point of view about energy as an energy-consuming nation. And here's, here's something that's true. The United States now is a net producer of oil. We used to be a net consumer. We have moved into that, and it's, some will say it's changed things in the Middle East, but we now are talking about beginning to sell oil to the rest of the world. We didn't used to do, 10 years ago, or some of you will remember 20 some years ago, we had to worry about, maybe it's longer than that, worry about our oil consumption. We had big discussions about it. We talked about alternative energy. But now because of fracking, we are actually in a position where we're beginning to talk about, or maybe we already are, maybe Glenn knows, we're actually selling oil. So there's the same story. One narrative is, as a, if you're an environmentalist, we have to be very concerned about how, how this proceeds. And another story from Joe Scarborough's point of view is, it's really important that we're doing this because it changes our international relationships, it's changing our position in the world, and fracking is uh, important. It's the same story, it is the same series of events with a different narrative. So narratives are important. Um, and then finally, Narratives are about the structure of the story. There is a classic structure to narratives that, that are changing, but it starts with, and this, this is sort of a basic principle of Blake Collins, all stories, all narratives, um, all of our communications efforts starts with a, con a, a belief that societies operate at, at an equilibrium. In every society, in every organization, every community, you get to a point, stasis, where things are operating okay. Uh, depending on who you are, it could be great or not so great, but communities are stable when they reach a point that they have equilibrium. We may not have, um, somebody was, is it Jeff? Somebody was saying, I wish that was a passenger train coming by. But there's a train, he, wa he wants passenger rail, but he's, he's not going anywhere, he's gonna stay in Bradenton. So he's gotten to a point where he's comfortable. That's called equilibrium. And that is, if you, if you watch any story, be it the Long Ranger in 30 minutes or a long movie, everything starts with, it's kind of okay. Things are going along so far. Gotham City is okay until uh, Bane comes and takes over. Then there's a period of disequilibrium. Um, I'm stealing from Glenn. Disequilibrium is, what, is when you find heroes. Disequilibrium is when the narrative changed to consider who those heroes might be. Because those people are going to run to the, the we call them triggering events, they're going to move toward that place where society is becoming unhinged. Um, it could be a natural disaster. Um, nine, well, I won't call it natural, 9-11, it could be that. It could be a hurricane. It could be an oil spill. Some of you might be familiar with that. The question is, when disequilibrium happens, when there's a triggering event, then you begin to find out who your heroes are. And in some cases, in our work, we always say, and you'll find out who the villains are. Because narratives are always about binary stories. There's a hero, there's a villain. There's a situation that occurs that disturbs our community. Uh, we've got to fix it. We've got to define what that is. And we've got to run to it. It's a classic story. Any, any movie you see, uh, I used Batman earlier, um, you know, things are going along fine in Gotham. Bane comes or it's the Joker. They destroy the town. But eventually what happens is the community or that hero works on it and finds a way to overcome that disequilibrium and restores it. That's the classic story. Now, I, I will ask you to do this, just as sort of a fun thing. I want you to go look at your favorite television show, look at, think about your favorite movie, and apply that theory to it. Apply the theory 
of uh, that narrative to your favorite show. It, it, an interesting thing just happened. We just had the, the, the new Star Wars movie come out. How many people saw it, have seen the new Star Wars? Okay. Does it, do you remember how familiar it is to the very first Star Wars with Luke and, you know, and the Jedi? If you look closely, it's the same exact storyline. There's this young person, male, who's for, lost and forlorn out in the desert, but the, the situation is such that it's fairly stable. He finds out, or she finds out, they've got some unique power and connection to these things, and they go off and, and get involved in, a, in a, an adventure where they overcome, at least temporarily, the empire and restore things to equilibrium. They did that, I think Star Wars is 30 years old, 20 years old, 30? Whatever it is, but we did that story already. It's the exact same story. What we've now, where it's changing, where the narrative is changing, is Luke Skywalker is now a woman, a girl. Got to be careful saying girl, right? <laughs> Luke. <laughs> I was talking to Luke Skywalker. It's it's changed, but it's the same story, and you have the same people. I, I don't want to say you almost have the same music, but that's a standard story. So Star Wars is a classic narrative. If you think about that, watch the movies, and it's going to make a lot of money if it hasn't already. That's the power of that narrative. What is equally powerful, though, is the fact that narratives are changing, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today because I think it's important to you, and I'm going the wrong way. Narratives are changing. Been a big discussion about um, law enforcement lately. And Jim, who's, who's that artist who did that? So this is a uh, Rockwell photo Morgan Rockwell. Morgan, from about 1940, I believe it is. And that's the classic picture of police community relations from 1940. And you have a police officer in a soda shop uh, talking to a young boy who's uh, on his way home. Maybe he's running away. You can do your own interpretation. And he's helping him, and he's talking, and he's coaching him. You know, you can see that. This image is new, and it's out there. If you can go on online and see it, if you can't describe it, you now have a police officer in riot gear with a uh, assault weapon and a billy club, and he's talking to a young black kid. And if you can't really see it, because we don't have, but the, the look on the, the faces are different. This kid is looking at this guy, saying, "Wow, that's really cool. Tell me, tell me all about it." I'm moving away from the mic. Tell me all about it. But that image says, I'm not quite sure what you're saying, but I'm concerned. So that's a change in the narrative. Why do I care about that? Why should you care about that? Because it has changed the way this country, and not just minorities, Hispanics, black people, it changed the way this country views law enforcement. We're at an all-time low in terms of respect for law enforcement officers in this country, ever. You know, it's dropped off, the narrative has changed. Um, that's important to how communities move forward. We've got to figure this out or our communities are going to continue to be roiled by this, this issue. So here's another narrative, and this is one, it's hard, again, hard to see. Glenn and I were talking about this. So I remember this um, from listening to my dad and my mom. What you do in America to succeed is you go to school, you know, be involved in athletics, work hard, uh, graduate from high school, go to college, get a good education, you know, take all the liberal arts courses you can, and then you go find a big company that's substantial that will teach you how to be a real worker, executive, etc. Whatever you learned in school, it's important, but not as important as what you're going to learn at that corporation you're going to work for for the next 20 years. You go there, you get your job working for Westinghouse, Prudential, not picking on anybody, but that's what you do. And then at the end of it, you make a contribution. Maybe you get to be CEO, maybe you don't. But what do you get at the end? You're going to get a pension. Well, first you're going to get respect in your community. He works at GE. He works at Westinghouse. She is involved with this hospital. She's been there 20 years. She knows everything. Um, and at the end of it, you'll get a pension. If you're lucky, you'll have a party. <laughs> They'll celebrate, everybody will dance and say, 
Glenn, do you remember when we did that 20 years ago? Everybody was, and, and you get a gold watch, or a, a, a watch that appears to be gold. I'm not quite sure that they were gold, but that's another story. Today's world, if you look at that, none of that happens. Uh, you heard people talking about earlier, if, uh, the, the projection is that you're going to have five careers, potentially. The projection, my, I have a daughter who is uh, in graduate school at, the, at King's College in London. Um, she, started, she started out, she went to an art school in high school, which was driving her father crazy. She's going to become an artist, and I'm like, really? How do I get my trip to Paris out of you being an artist? I don't really understand that. But she did well, and then somewhere in the process, she found out she liked numbers and math, and my brother's a banker. So she started, um, she graduates and goes to, to, to undergrad, and she gets into that, and she gets away from, totally away from art. She starts thinking about planning and economics, and it turns out she's a whiz in, in accounting. And I'm like, who is this person? I, I've been, I tried to get you to do that the whole time you are in high school, my narrative. And now she's um, at King's College in London studying uh, international economics because she's really in, that's, I don't have any idea who she is anymore. I do know her narrative has changed and it probably will change again while I know her, but she has no idea of trying to go work for Prudential or any company that's going to give her a gold watch. What she wants to know is what she can do in the next three year horizon. So that's a narrative that's changing, has changed. And if you aren't dealing with it, and here's one that happened to me on the way here, Uber and Taxi. So some of you will remember the sitcom that was on television, uh, Taxi. Uh, Danny DeVito was it. And everybody would meet every day at the taxi dispatching place and they'd have this conversation about life. And they talk about their relationships and their people that they picked up. And it was kind of interesting and kind of funny. And it was probably cheap to, uh, to, to do it because you could sit around in this uh, small set. You know, there's only one shot. And then the rest of it was driving around in a cab. And it was very successful. It was on for a long time. Uh, lock, lock, uh, all these people were in it and mechanics and so on talking about life. Well. That, that was the way the taxi industry ran. And the taxi industry continued that narrative of sort of being there. You could be entrepreneurial to some degree, but have a company that supported you. And they had unions, and they had um, medallions, and they had all kinds of things. And they controlled the uh, vehicle for hire business. Yesterday, I flew in from DC. I stopped at Tampa Airport, which they surprised me. And I whipped out my cell phone and went to my Uber app and called up an Uber to take me from Tampa International Airport to St. Petersburg. I was surprised, I, in my travels, I use Uber a lot, not unusual. I was surprised because the narrative has changed in Tampa in less than a year. Tampa Airport used to block the signal from Uber. They used to block it because there is a, a, a transportation authority in Hillsborough County that controls all the medallions and the taxi drivers have been suing Uber and Lyft and everybody and they had convinced various people to not allow that technology to be there. So it used to block the signal. And I just tried it because I couldn't get anybody to pick me up. So I, I, I open it up, I look at Uber, now it works, but not only that, they have one of the, uh, they have a very robust system of identifying where you are in the airport. Blue Arrival, Jet Blue, This Door, et cetera, all that. They couldn't do that. Uber couldn't do that without the support of TIA, Tampa International Airport. So there it was, the taxi industry right here in our backyard, still fighting on what I would call the old narrative of we're going to, you know, we own transportation and you don't. And the, the International Airport, which is a regional organization, is changing their narrative. What was even funnier, Sarah, is I'm standing there, here's something about narratives too. So I'm standing there getting ready to take the Uber, and the woman next to me who, she's older than me, so she's probably a uh, mature individual. Um, I won't call her a senior citizen or a whoopee. She probably is a well-off old person because she's flying in here and she's on her way to uh, Bradenton for some R&R. &R. But she's standing there and she's got her phone out and she asks the person next to me, um, 
who's about your age, um, how to use Uber. And it's a young man, and um, he's giving her information, I'm listening, and he's got it wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's about to send this very nice, a mature lady off in the wrong direction and she'll end up God knows where. And I'm, so I stand there for a while. I have, you know, my own narrative is mind your own business. But after a while, I'm like, okay, this kid's gonna send her. She's gonna be standing here for 25 minutes or half an hour because she hadn't pushed the button. You know, so you've seen the commercial, we'll push the button. Well, she, she got the app up, whatever, but she didn't push the request, UberX or whatever. She didn't push it. So I started explaining to her um, how it worked. And she said, oh, this is my first time using it. And I just figured I'd ask somebody who was 20 some years old how to do it because, you know, that's the narrative. That's how it works. And I said, actually, the narrative is, look at who's got their phone in their hand, a smartphone in their hand, and is using it. That's the narrative. Just because this guy's 22 years old, he, and when we got into a conversation with him, not picking on him, he'd only used Uber once in his life, and that was while he was in D.C. And he didn't really know how to use it. So she took... She didn't want to run a car. She wanted to get here. She used Uber. That's a new narrative. She's, you know, she's older than I am, and she's using That tells you that Uber has changed the narrative, and the taxi industry is losing. So why is that important? Why do you care about that one way or the other? And in the, in, in the spirit of what Sarah told me to do is talk about why narratives are important. And I, I promise. I don't see her in the room. I promise I would talk about it. I mentioned to you earlier Ta-Nehisi Coates. And it also goes with the new narrative. Ta-Nehisi Coates is an African-American male. I call him young. He's 41 years old now. Um, he was, uh, he is just, uh, he was a student at Howard University. And he, he comes from Baltimore. We didn't do well in high school. Decided to go to Howard University, a historically black college. And, He's pretty smart, but he was a horrible student. So by, by his sophomore year, he had stopped going to class, bad narrative, and was spending all of his time in the library, studying, telling him about how to be a writer, et cetera, et cetera. Tanasi Coates now writes for, in the new narrative, he was a blogger, then he started writing columns, now he writes for Atlantic Magazine, he's written a book that's gotten, he's getting the Pulitzer, just got it, uh, uh, this year, 2015, and he just received a, a genius grant from the MacArthur Foundation, $500,000 for him to think. So there's a new narrative. We're not all going to be ta Coates, Coates, but the point is he did not do it the way my parents taught me, the way he certainly is more like my daughter than I am, but here he is and he's applying his skills and he's got another career. Now, his, the next thing that's happened, which is fascinating to me, is he's been asked to collaborate with, a, with, I think it's CBS or NBC, on a new TV series. So let's see, he's a college dropout who hung out in the library, who is a blogger who's written a Pulitzer Prize winning book. Now he's a genius grant, and he's about to become a TV producer. I, I don't know if he's up to five yet, five careers, but it's amazing to watch, and that's part of the new narrative. So why is that important to you? What, and what can you do about this um, now? When in our business, we talk about narratives are accelerators. You saw Jim say earlier, it's a nudge, but every story that you tell, every story that you tell has a narrative. It gives the context for why you do what you do and how you do it. Um, we think that you need to make sure in your business, in your, if you're attacking a, a community situation, that you think long and hard about what the narrative is. And Sarah, to your point, it's not necessarily going to come to you all at once in, a, in an explosion. You may have to work at it and work on it, talk to a lot of people and adjust it. But the narrative is important because it's how people think about things. It's how, it's a shortcut, call it an app, it is a shortcut to context. If you get people convinced that there's a narrative and you get them aligned on the narrative, you then begin to drive forward the conversation. Case in point, uh, I was here, I don't know how many years ago, somebody would tell me it was more like 15, maybe it was 10, part of a community conversation in Bradenton area about downtown. 
And there was a, a massive conversation going on. There were people who wanted to keep it kind of the way it was. And there was another group of people, and I can't tell you who, who all of them were, but they were saying, you know, we really have a jewel here. We have something that the world would really like to see, but we just don't know it. As, as an African proverb that talks about acres of diamonds beneath your feet. They didn't look, somebody looked down and said, we've got a diamond here. If we just put some things here, bring people to the water, wow, look at what we're having. What they did first was change the narrative. They changed the narrative that we're not, you know, your daddy's Oldsmobile. They changed the narrative and said, look, let's have another way of thinking about this. So when we talk to our clients, the first thing we want to have them do is think about what, what, what's your narrative and, and how, what's your role in the narrative. When you, when you think about your company and you start to t talk about your narrative, so are you the hero? Is your company the hero of their narrative? Is somebody going to come along and say, wow, they're really doing something great? Um, Uber is a great example of a company that has adjusted to um, the trend, political trends, social trends, technology trends, and also to some people, they're, they've got a hero narrative. I'm saving you money. My ride from Tampa International Airport to my home in downtown St. Petersburg cost me $21. That's incredible. I don't think they can keep the price down that long, uh, but that's an incredible saving. You couldn't get a, a cab would be more like 80. That's amazing. And they responded to my, my direction. I was totally in control of it. It's part of the new narrative. So the question I would ask you is, ask you about your, and I, we can have this conversation. If I asked you about your company, and I won't, I'm not gonna call you out, but maybe you wanna, Tell me about your business, your organization, and say, if somebody writes a narrative and talks about you in context, are you, is your company, your organization, the hero of your own narrative? Are you? Are you contributing something that's gonna change the world, or change your community, or change the, you know, something of value? Are you the hero of your own narrative? And if you are, then tell me about the context. In what context, how do you deliver that? What are you gonna say to people when you say, I'm the hero of this narrative because of, X and Y and Z, but perhaps most importantly and most profound, let me stop, Every, if you go, another exercise to take, go pick up your local newspaper. Got to, right, people here familiar with the Porner Institute, or we're in St. Pete, they teach journalists, go pick up your newspaper, here's a shortcut. Most, about 90% of the stories in the newspaper have three things, a villain, a victim, and a vindicator. Read a story and ask yourself, okay, who's the villain in this particular news article? I, 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 yes, I understand there's, there's some good news stories, et cetera, but if you, you know, if you read an editorial, who's the villain? Who is the newspaper, what's the news, your newspaper's point of view like? Who's the villain? Usually the newspaper stories will give you a villain and a victim. Um, we don't have enough funds for uh, I'll do Flint, Michigan. We have a problem in Flint, Michigan because the water's been poisoned and this series of public officials did something wrong. There's a villain and the victim is the people who drank the water. And the question is, and what drives that story, what keeps it alive and will keep it alive for another year is they're spending their time trying to figure out who's gonna fix it. Who's the vindicator? Because that's the way we tell stories. Flint was doing fine, they had reasonable drinking water something went wrong, we have bad drinking water, who's gonna fix it? And the person who fixes it, the organization who fixes it, will be the hero. That's how they write newspaper stories. So the final thing I wanna ask, so I'm asking you, are you the hero of your own? If you think about your narrative, are you as an individual in your own career a hero? Are you uh, Katniss or Cinderella? Are you, uh, wa you know, just watching? Are you aware that the narrative is changing? What's, what's your point of view? What's the context in which you tell it? But the most important thing we say to all of our clients is, are you the narrator of your own story? Because you can be an architect of change or a tenant of results. You either change your own story or somebody's gonna change it for you. And I'll stop there and take questions.
Okay, so if you would use the mic up here if you have some questions or comments. Um, so I remember when, uh, Tony, we were talking on the phone the other day. Please, please just come up, okay, if you have, if you have something you want to share. Um, when he, uh, we were talking, and so I, I had, I wrote that down, and I, if you follow anything we do, I put it out on LinkedIn. Because that piece of um, deciding your future, you know, as, as we talk about, as we put the table tents out in, in a few moments, um, so many people have this place where we talk about it is what it is. Has anybody heard that? And, and that's where people live. It is what it is. And, um, but I think that there's another question that we have to come with after that, and that it is what it is, so what are we going to do about it? You know, I've been uh, this thing about the hero's journey for a long time, because if it just is what it is, then I'm a victim. Yes. But Cinderella. I'm Cinderella. I, I, it, 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 you know, but, and I need a fairy godmother to come and rescue me. But what am I going to do about it? I think the, the most uh, important things that have happened in my life is when I've said, so how am, what, what did I do to play a part in this? You know, because stuff happens, but I always have the choice to respond to it or react. And so how can I move, how can I reframe what I'm looking at so that I'm not a victim, whether it's Flint, Michigan. Now what's really interesting about Flint is some of the stories that we have in strategic doing. Um, there's a gentleman there, Bob Brown, and um, he's worked with Purdue Center for Regional Development. And um, so they have, they have a story, they have a narrative um, from a couple of years ago already on that they weren't waiting for the federal government to ride in and rescue them. So they have a culture. Now it'll be interesting to see with the new challenges of this, and you have kids that are sick dying, okay, um, are they gonna be able to leverage off an old story or a pattern of success and be able to take that into their future? So I would just add, I mean, some places that work, some things you may remember. Uh, Cleveland, remember the mistake on the lake? They, they, they put up with that story for a very long time and someone said, you know what, we don't have to do this. I had a conversation with Glenn and he was talking about the work he's doing and you know, talking about this afternoon in Ireland where those communities, and I'm not gonna give away your punchline, but where those communities decided, they had a narrative about people in Ireland and how they work and what they do, and they decided that they were going to change it. They decided, you know what, um, we, we have the opportunity to write our own narrative. Here's what it looks like. Here's how we're going to do it. And then what it takes, you, to your point earlier, it takes teamwork and a team and getting people on board to do that. It's not going to be done, you know, there is, the Lone Ranger story is really just a myth. It doesn't really get done that way. But it starts with saying, Here's what people think about my community or me or my company. How am I going to change that? Um, there was an airline, I can't remember who it was, that crashed a long time ago down in South Florida. And they, then they changed their name a couple times. Who was it? Yes. And what they had to do was go back and reinvent themselves because, or they could just sit there and be a, the, you know, a victim. They can sit there and be bad news. So what we find in communications and strategies, you've got to get, Glenn, all the people, your leadership team, your executive team, and other stakeholders to say, here's a narrative we're trying to write. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's how we're trying to change the world. Get people invested in that, because then you can tell a, a million different stories about the same narrative. So I had asked earlier, and I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer, as an experiment, but does anybody want to talk about their, their company or their organization and tell me what your narrative is? Anybody want to try that? Well, and I'll throw out when we talk, when we, when we're talking about some things, um, is, uh, has anybody read the, um, the book Switch by Chip and Dan Heath? Oh my gosh. So, um, and as we go into the next exercise and we're talking about narratives and new stories, um, they talk about bright spots. So tomorrow we have a we have a little piece right right before lunch that I think you guys are gonna love. Um, last year we flew drones in the convention center. Okay, who got to see those? Was that like awesome? If you haven't seen it, it's on our video. Um, it was super exciting because we actually have some really great assets here um, in education. However, if you Google education in Manatee County, we also got some really crummy stories. 
We got some crummy stories. And what happens typically is we're so busy talking about the crummy stories. Stan has a couple of slides on success stories, which I do want you to do. Um, because we get so caught up in talking about what's wrong that we miss what's right. And so I say on a regular basis, if we could just do a little less of what's wrong and do a little bit more of what's right, we could make huge changes in our community. And so when we talk to people, we don't talk about, oh my gosh, well, this is you know um, the challenges that we're facing. We talk about we have a kindergarten through 12th grade program that we have um, that's absolutely incredible, and if you haven't toured our science and engineering program, you need to. Doug Wagner will be here tomorrow. If, uh, if I talk about him like he walks on water, it's because I think he does. I think he does. Um, and you'll see by his students tomorrow that he brings in. And so, yeah, now the program's only in, um, we only have 40 science and engineering teachers in all of Manatee County that are doing this program. So it's not in all the elementary schools. It's not everywhere. That's, that's what I would love to see, is that this program would be everywhere. That other communities would come and see what's happening and take it back to their communities. But in the meantime, we're gonna be evangelists mm -hmm. and we're gonna, we're gonna tell people about the story, the one that's right. And so what you love in Switch is it says the way you change things, is not about the, the TBUs, the true but useless. You know, oh yes, we need to have all these things in order. Well. Everything's not gonna be in order. You've heard that thing that if you wait for all the lights to get green, you'll never get to town, especially not in our traffic. So one of the things, I'll, I'll use St. Petersburg as an example. When I was there, I, I ran both economic development and housing and we put them together. It's, about, it's a vision thing, probably a bad combination for those of you in economic development. But in any event, one of the things we knew was we had to change our housing stock downtown, we, we, we thought we were competing only with Tampa. So all the executives, would, you know, even if they moved in, they'd go live in Tampa. That's what we used to experience. And there was a saying about housing in Pinellas County, and St. Pete in particular, you either had trash or treasure. Two bedroom bungalows, uh, uh, one bath. It was, you know, not executive housing. Um, or actually not millennial housing. So we spent some time thinking about it. And the first thing that we did was, convened a meeting of the stakeholders and the communities to start talking about what we were doing right. We, and there's an article, it's sort of laugh, I laugh about it now because uh, we went around and talked about what we were doing right and where we wanted to go. And now, 10 years later, 15 years later, if you go look at housing in downtown St. Pete, it's kind of crazy. Uh, million dollar condominiums, I think we've overdone it. But we have condominiums that started a million. Uh, the president of Home Shopping Network lives downtown. I can't think of this millennial movie star's name. We have people, movie stars eating um, in the restaurants in downtown St. Pete walking around. That, that's about a, a different narrative, because the narrative had been, you know, only old people go here to you know, die and retire. Anybody remember the green benches? Uh, who grew up in St. Pete? There you okay. Go. Remember the green we bench? didn't go downtown when I was in high school. That was like not cool. It was not the place that we wanted to hang out. And now, who goes, who's been to downtown St. Pete? I remember walks from downtown. Oh, is it like is it cool? Yeah. It is. It is. It is cool. That's definitely not the story. Um, now there's like this new thing with buses, and they're refiguring out how to better serve their yeah. community. Um, and uh, because Williams Park was a place that was only homeless and. Uh, it was homeless and street walkers, people that were in drug people. It was, it was the, the not part of life that I'm really familiar with. Uh, okay. So you can tell, I don't, have, I don't have a vocabulary for that, you know, maybe, I, and I don't work in law enforcement. But so it was like, nobody went there, and you certainly didn't go after dark. And, and Williams Park is a good example about a new narrative because of that. First of all, let me make sure you understand. I'm not suggesting that you don't need good planning that you've got to have the right financing, that you don't need good account. You need all those things. But as we talked about Sisyphus earlier, if you're going to push a rock up the hill, it's a big rock, you need a narrative, a vision that helps you do it. Today, no, this week, earlier Tuesday, those of you who know Williams Park, it was closed or changed. There are no more buses going around Williams Park in downtown St. Pete. It is, they're recapturing it, if you want to call it that. They're taking, they've changed the traffic patterns 
so that it's about walking, talking, walk, usable space, and the buses are now dispersed throughout downtown. So the next time you go see Williams Park, you won't see uh, that environment. It's gonna be more of a place where you ride your bike, skateboard, um, we used to call it the, uh, the, the fact, when you, when you'll know that we've made it when you notice that it's young, it's moms with kids and families walking through the park. That's the new Williams Park, and that has just, that happened this Tuesday. So, is it qu questions or comments, or we can stop here, but I, if you don't, go ahead. That's what we saw last night, wasn't it, Glenn? Sure is. Uh, I want to give you a, maybe this is a fastball over the outside corner here for you to swing at, is uh, narratives. Uh, there's, we have probably some of the luckiest people in here. A lot of you really have great narratives in your companies. But if we went out to the community at large, we'd probably find out the vast majority of people would say, if anything our co in our company, we're not the heroes, we're the villains. <laughs> or, or we haven't even figured out what, 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 what scenario we're in. We don't have a narrative. Is how would you go about recommending young leaders or even older leaders to start helping create the narrative that they would like to see two, three, four years in the future for their company? Yeah, and I think that's a great question. I think that is the operative question. Um, it, it's a process. The first one, and I'm, you didn't give me your name. Tell me your name. Carrie. Carrie, well, Carrie and I were having this conversation, and the first thing I said, I think leaders, leaders step forward in times of need. They don't want to get elected. They don't wait to be told that they're leading. You begin to start thinking like a leader and acting like a leader, which is first, let's talk about recognizing what the problem is. So I, those young leaders, I'd go out and I'd say, you know what, we spend entirely too much time talking about homelessness in downtown Sarasota. We gotta do something different. And it's a problem that we all have to work on, so I don't have all those, those years of experience. I'm talking to young people, and I have all those years of experience, but I do have an ability to analyze this problem, and I know that I need to go get Sarah involved in this. I need to hook her into working on this. So I would, I would say that, one, um, we can begin to know that the structure of the narrative, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a villain, and I'll use Sarah's tells, homelessness may be, could be described as a problem in Sarah, downtown Sarah, so at least they're talking about it. But I don't think it's the homeless that are the, who are the villains. You're gonna to have to figure that out. But what the community needs, and I can't sing it, but we need a hero. And that's that person, young women, who, or young men, who are gonna step forward and say, okay, I wanna go work on this problem. I wanna go take on this challenge. And what I do recognize is it's not gonna be the Lone Ranger. It's gonna be a collective, strategic doing. It's gonna be a collective action. So I would, I would tell them, there's, there's research on it, but I would step forward, find that organization, find that entity, be in this room, listen, and then go grab it. Don't, one of the things, I, my daughter I keep talking about, but one of the things, she never, she doesn't wait for me to say, this is how we're gonna solve this problem. She says, hey, have you seen this new app? Have you done this? Have you thought about it that way? So one, I would encourage the millennials, go do it. Figure out what the problem is, figure out, what the leadership issue is, and begin to talk to people around you. They may not always respond right away and say, oh, that's a great idea. They may give you a quizzical look, but start the conversation. Because the narrative changes when you say it changes. That's, I like that, that the narrative changes when you say it changes. Um, and I would encourage, as, as for us, um, and in working with young people is um, we really work to make ourselves available and um, encourage people to step out. And then, um, and it's really a principle of stewardship is allowing people to, um, to not control it. So you're there, you're available, you're kind of doing this. We're there to support, we're not guiding the movement, we give input. Um, and we're just, we're just there as, as encouragers. Uh, you'll get to the opportunity to talk to our Manatee Millennial Movement group, um, Simone, Ogden, and Annie. And um, what I love about getting to work with them is uh, we're in this strategic doing process with our county. And so um, over the next two days, you're gonna see some videos and some things that they've done. And uh, we started this process about, um, 
not quite a year ago, and we said, you know, we, they did this IC Manatee event. We said, you know, it would be really cool if we did something bigger. And so we were talking about this like in August, and we said, let's plan something in February or March, and let's uh, really get the colleges involved, and we could do this. And for us, we always blow things up, you know, what's the really big idea? And then we say, well, what's really, you know, what really should we do? I mean, we could do all this, but it all doesn't make sense. And so then we narrow it down. And what happened is we thought we were going to do this event in like February or March. And um, what happened is our young leaders came back to us and they said, you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to do a, a millennial conference. And so um, you can see on the website, it says hashtag for progress. And there, they said, you know, we're gonna do, we're gonna do like a local, maybe regional event. And I said, no, it's not gonna be regional. It's gonna be national this year, because already they'll be present in the conversations um, over over the conference. They're, they'll be present in the conversations, and they're already getting exposure. Um, and so there will be people, there'll probably be students from St. Leo's who will be here for hashtag for progress. How do we have a voice in our community? Um, and as we share this in other places, like with Jackie, you know, she works with young women and, and women of different ages all over. How, what is that like in giving people a voice? So by next year, they're already planning because we've been encouraging them. They're planning that 2017, their event will be a national event. And they hope to gather young leaders from around the country together and talk about civic engagement and how do they have a voice and how can they participate. That, is that exciting? And, and it's not our event. What's really cool is in this process of strategic doing, in this process of narratives and conversations, um, it really wasn't a whole lot more work for us. And it really isn't a whole lot more work for the people involved. What happens is that we became better, sharper, and we leveraged our results and um, we leveraged our time, talent, and treasure results. So, and are you getting your slides ready, Stan? Okay, cool. Glenn, also in response, to, I wanna add, uh, you have a question, I was gonna also give another response. I talked to millennials for a second, but for people like me who may have one or two gray hairs. There's something else to think about in terms of how you do that. Uh, I was traveling, um, it was a UN um, mission um, review of some refugee camps in Ethiopia in December, and I was there. And I saw an amazing leader, a, a woman who was um, working with the UN, and what we, we were in one of the camps, and on that particular day, 180 people came in to the camps that they'd walked across uh, parts of Eritrea into Ethiopia. And what was going on was they were doing intake and they start to ask them questions and where they're from. Bob. And so when the people, when these uh, refugees arrived at the camp, they spent, when they got there, it was like midday, they had them standing there answering questions or filling up papers for eight hours. Yeah, and you, and you think, you said, wow, because they have to get all this information. So the leader, the, the executive who's in charge of a woman, wa walks over and starts talking to someone who's uh, sort of in a janitorial capacity at the camp, a young uh, man. And she said, well, what do you think about this process? And the young man, not knowing who she was, says, I won't use that word. He said, it's terrible. This process is terrible. You ought to get these people. They just walked you know, the last 50 miles they didn't have anything to drink, they didn't have anything to eat, they're dusty, they're tired. You can get the basic information, get them assigned, get them in place, let them sleep, and get up and do that the next morning. And, and the, the woman, Lavinia, said, well, tell me more about that. And the person said, yeah, whoever's running this thing has some other phrases we won't use. <laughs> and they really ought to get their, get their act together. And then the young man turned and said, well, what do, you, what do you think? He said, well, I'm that person you're talking about who's got their head in the wrong place, <laughs> and you're absolutely right. We ought to change that. And on that day, they, changed, they started changing the process. So I'm encouraging people with some gray in your hair, seek out those people, take a look at it, do that 360 look and say, well, okay, what am I doing wrong? You know, go, go out of your way to talk to the people who aren't in the game and say, re-engineer this for me. Think about it a different way. And then be willing to accept it. So I, I don't know if there was another question. I think we'll get rid of it. Frank, do you have a, I asked you to come up here, so. 
especially because don't start till you get up here. Nobody will be able to hear you. You're quiet. Okay. Well, you've asked uh, to sort of uh, have an opportunity to review, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, a narrative. Well, I have a group called uh, Citizens Concerned About Education. And uh, we're passionate about working with community leaders uh, uh, and uh, who are uh, ver very concerned that the next generation will not be vi viable employees. Uh, we offer these leaders the ability to work with like-minded people in a safe environment, and uh, that includes uh, using strategic doing. After getting together, we affect changes in education. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's one of those hero narratives that I would describe that, and I like what you're doing there. I would tell you, though, it's, you've got to somehow get the Lone Ranger in or Django mm. in there, something that people can quickly, when I, when I did the um, mm. thing about Robin Hood, everybody knew that Robin Hood robs from the? And gives to the? And so your narrative has to, it's succinct and powerful. I think, and I was talking to you briefly, I think you're there, I think you've got the right thing, and I would challenge you to work at it a little harder to get it down to something that people can say. It's, it's like that app on your phone. You know, you can look at it and it's gonna instantly spit mm -hmm. your name and your organization's name out the end of it. 